across the length and breadth of Britain, factories and workshops are hives of activity, producing all manner of products, including pianos. These intricate wooden machines combine thousands of moving parts in a design that hasn't changed in hundreds of years. I don't think many people realise quite how complex a piano is. People often say, well, I had no idea there was all that going on inside there. Pianos can produce the widest range of notes of any instrument. Their versatility makes them one of the world's most popular instruments. Sometimes people say pianos are old-fashioned or past their heyday. Actually, globally, there's many more people playing the piano now than ever before. Most of the world's pianos are built in Japan and China, but Britain has a proud tradition of piano making. Years ago, in the 1920s, uh, there were 150 piano manufacturers in London alone. But times have changed, and Cavendish pianos, based in Bolton Abbey, Yorkshire, are now the only piano factory left in Britain. They're taking on the mass-produced foreign imports and are dedicated to keeping their craft alive. We find that if we take care over each tiny detail, then they do all add up um, to make a, a, a better quality instrument. We use as many local products as, as we possibly can. It's like a sort of craftsman's cooperative that comes together to build one piano. A dozen different craftsmen supply Adam with the 20,000 parts that go into every and each instrument. Alchemy is a, a great word, I think. You know, it's just wood and it's just leather and felt and metal. And if you put them together in a particular way, uh, you've got something that uh, sings and makes music, you know, which is, I, I find that quite extraordinary, really. Today, the team are working on an upright Cavendish model, and one of the most important parts is the soundboard. The heart of every piano is the soundboard. This is the soul of the instrument. The soundboard is the piano's amplifier. When a player presses a key, a hammer strikes a steel string under very high tension, causing it to vibrate. The vibration is transferred onto the soundboard, where the larger surface area produces a much louder sound. It's a very particular process to make a soundboard. It's made out of very special tone wood, which is grown at altitude. Tone wood, in this case spruce, grows slower than normal, making it light enough to vibrate but strong enough to withstand the tension of the strings. Bars of wood called ribs are glued onto the soundboard, giving it extra strength, as well as a bridge that will connect the strings to the board, bridging the vibrations. This gluing process, the way we do it, is the traditional way, the way that it was done 100 years ago. Nowadays, it's often done with a modern press, but we do it in the traditional way. It gives us more control. Lengths of wood are wedged on top of the board as the glue sets, forcing the flexible soundboard into a gentle curve. We can get such a, 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 a level of accuracy when we're gluing our soundboard that we wouldn't, couldn't possibly do if it was more automated. You might think when you look at the soundboard it's just flat, like a table, but actually it has a curve in it. This is very important because it acts against the pressure pushing down from the strings. It's quite a complex thing to do, uh, but if you get it just right, then you get the magic of that beautiful, silky, silvery tone, that warmth that we're looking for. The next stage is to marry the finished soundboard onto a cast iron frame. Weighing nearly a quarter of a tonne, the frame needs to be strong enough to withstand the massive forces that will be created by the strings. This is what's going to carry the tension of all those strings. And the tension of the strings is uh, equivalent to the weight of two cars. We've got a very delicate, handmade wooden soundboard, which has got all that tension on it. So it needs to be very stiff, but it also needs to be able to vibrate to make the tone. Once the soundboard and frame have been sandwiched together, it's time to add the strings. What we can see happening here 
is the copper wound bass strings being loaded onto the piano frame. The string is attached to a tuning pin, one of these. And now that part of the pin goes into a pin block and uh, so that has to be hammered in and it's very loud. It's loud anyway but that sound is amplified because of the soundboard so it really is pretty loud noise. Pianos usually have around 230 strings, more than any other instrument, but this model has 247 to produce more volume and an even better tone. The eye of the string gets threaded over the hitch pin and then it goes via the bridge pins. This is where the pressure, downward pressure onto the bridge happens and then it goes all the way to the other end of the frame through the agraph onto the tuning pin. The strings vary in length and thickness to create different tones. Thicker, longer wires create deeper notes, thin, short ones the highest. Now, if there's too much pressure, well, the soundboard can crack. It's a very fragile assembly. If there's not enough pressure, then the sound of the piano will be thin and nondescript. So it's very important that we have the right amount of pressure. You might think all them strings make the piano a string instrument. In fact, when played as part of an orchestra, the piano's hammers put it in the percussion section. But if you really want to show off, technically, the chordophones, instruments that produce sound through vibrating strings, who knew that? Once the strings are in place, um, there's quite a lot of tension and there's quite, quite a lot of uh, um, uh, movement. So it's important that the, the whole assembly gets left to rest. And we'll leave it for uh, approximately a month before the next process starts. Um, we're often asked how long it takes to build a piano. Uh, the slower you build it, the better product you'll have at the end of the day. Next up, it's time to assemble the case. This has been fully strung. It's now been roughly tuned, probably four or five times, and it's rested, which is the important thing. So once it's upright, because it's an upright piano, we need something to rest the keys on that then uh, work the action that then plays the strings. And you can see with a bit of imagination that that's starting to look like an actual piano. Uh, this is built out of solid English oak. The case is made for us in uh, a place called Otley and he's a real old-fashioned cabinet maker. Um, so our pianos are unusual in that um, they're not just uh, musical instruments but they're, they're cabinet-made furniture as well. So it might not look much like what we um, what we think of as an upright piano, but uh, now if we bring it onto its feet, you can see it's starting to look like what we recognise as an upright piano. The strung back is all finished, the acoustic body of the instrument is all done, and now we've uh, got the, the key bed in place, which will house the keyboard and the action, uh, the all-important action that plays the strings of the piano. The piano action is the wooden mechanism that translates a key being pressed into a hammer, striking the string. Invented by Bartolomeo Cristofori in 1698, the principles are much the same today. A series of levers turn the small movement of the keys into the large motion of the hammer. What made Cristofori's action revolutionary was the fact it was touch sensitive. A light touch creates a quiet sound a heavy touch creates a louder sound. In fact, the name piano is short for pianoforte, from the Italian for soft and loud. 300 years later, his design is largely unchanged. So this is a blank action, we call this, and it has to be built for each individual piano. So every piano is slightly different. You can't just take one action out of one piano and put it in another, um, each action has to be individually built. The 88 felt covered hammers are matched to hammer shanks, depending on the natural tone each shank makes. So as you can hear, um, this shank here has a higher pitch um, when, when it's dropped onto the surface than this one. So this, this shank will uh, 
you know, be more suited to the treble end of the, uh, of the piano. At the other end of the action are the 88 keys. The most familiar part of the piano for everyone is the piano keys. Keys are made out of wood and uh, the key top nowadays is made out of a ceramic material. Of course, it used to be elephant ivory and thank goodness that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, also, the sharps used to be made out of tropical hardwoods. Again, that doesn't happen anymore. The keys are individually weighted so that the lower notes feel heavier than the higher, lighter ones. Once the keys are fitted onto the action, the pedals can be installed. A modern upright piano has three pedals. The right hand pedal, or the right foot pedal, um, is uh, what we call the sustain pedal. And what it does is it pulls those dampers off the strings. So all the strings in the piano are all sounding and you get this wonderful sustaining sound. The left pedal is much more seldomly used it gives you the ability to play more quietly. The middle pedal of an upright piano is usually a practice pedal. It means that people can practice in their own little space without worrying about other people listening and judging them and all that sort of thing. With all the acoustic parts in place, they're thoroughly tested. I love this tune! The purpose of this machine, uh, affectionately known as the basher, is uh, to play in the piano. So every note is played over 32,000 times. Turn that thing off! After a good bashing, the piano is retuned. Final bits of cabinetry are assembled and it's dispatched to the showroom. Ready to bring years of enjoyment to one very lucky musician.